All right, so first of all, I want to thank you and I want to thank Muta for actually this opportunity. It's great to talk about uh, how we're thinking about Muta, where we're applying the Muta. This is going to be a bit more technical talk. Uh, so a few words about me. I am head of architecture for JP Morgan Cloud and Data Analytics on the Cloud. Uh, as part of that, we're also implementing policies and security. So here I am. Uh, that was my day job, my evening job, I guess, is I also teach. I also work at Columbia, where I'm working on the data management classes and on uh, management classes on Teams. So I'm going to try to bring it all together and talk about, uh, first of all, what we want to apply in, 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 the, in this agenda. Number one, I want to define what does scale mean, because I want to talk about how do we want to scale policies in the large enterprise. What does a scale mean? How do we define a scale? Uh, what does it mean to talk about user journeys and who is the user for this data that we're trying to secure? What does it mean to create a dynamic policy and why it's important for us? What does it mean to run policy as code? And that's what we do in, in JP Morgan. We're really thinking about the policy as code and how we're going to control it and manage that. And the last one, if you're talking about the code, the natural step would be how do we do unit tests? And I think the concept of monitoring, it really resonates with what we're thinking internally as well. We're working very closely with Mute on this on how do we start thinking about the impact the policy or attributes or tagging or anything else that policy requires makes on the end user. So uh, number one, uh, scale. Uh, everybody knows about Chase, I'm sure. Uh, you know, one of the oldest institutions, 1799, I think, when we started as an origination. But where, where are we today? This slide is a bit old, it's one year old, so imagine this number just keeps growing. Um, what I want to call out here in the context of immune and data is uh, how much data do we have? We are in excess of 500 petabytes today. How many employees do we have that use data or work with data? Over 250,000. About over 100,000 are people that actually work with data on a daily basis, analysts and data scientists. We have over 60,000 engineers. We operate in over 100 different markets. We operate in over 60 different countries, right? So when we talk about the scale, this is a scale of an enterprise that we operate in. And I can argue that uh, we can probably rival some of the, you know, quote unquote, internet companies at that scale, especially around data and the complexity we have around data. But the challenge that uh, we need to overcome is uh, some companies, you know, if you lose 10 light clicks, you know, it's okay. If we have an issue with a trade or customer engagement, it's a severe damage to organization and to a client relationship. So the rigor and controls we put around data is probably on a different level. Now, when we talk about scale, uh, let's talk about what does it mean uh, or how we're thinking about scaling the data. When we think about scaling data, the goal for us is really around scaling data for the end consumer. End consumer, in this case, will be uh, an analyst or a reporter or a data scientist. So when we think about this on a very simple terms, we really want to go into a concept of data democratization. And the point of data democratization is what Matt, I think, touched on. It's really how fast can somebody find the data, be self-sufficient to start using the data. We're thinking about agility. And when we talk about data agility, it's not necessarily around how fast I can start using the data. It's really around how fast can we introduce a change to the data. And this we can propagate throughout the organization. We can start adopting the change. Now, we have to do all this without compromising any of the controls and security. And obviously, we need to do it at the global scale. All right? So if you think about that, let's now talk about some of that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to skip to the set quickly. But how we're thinking about it is we, we're looking at more modern architectures like a data mesh. Probably everybody's familiar with the concept. Uh, but from a data mesh, I want to talk more around how do we think about data mesh and, and why it's important to us. Data mesh is a concept that really forces us to start thinking about data as a product which is a great concept, because when you have a product, you kind of need to assume that you're going to have a client, right? And if you have a client, you build a product for the consumer. It changes the way you engineer the product. It changes the way you're trying to uh, make it available. And it changes the way you make it discoverable and accessible. And data mesh, uh, the main point for us around data mesh is a self-service. How do we move our client experience into self-service analytics? But you can't really do self-service, especially data mesh, uh, where we start talking about technology, very diverse set of technology in, in our organization, and we start federating from a central lake to federate technology stacks. We cannot do it without federated approach to policy and governance. And this is where Mute is really helping us. Uh, so let's talk about user experience and the user journey. I'm going to make uh, uh, an assumption here. 
Everybody is different, but in the end, we all follow the same road, right? Think about uh, the uh, people that do reporting. Think about the people that do analytics, like dashboard, interactive reporting. Think about people and data scientists. The, the, the journey is pretty much the same. The outcome is different, but the journey is the same. Everything starts in one place. I need to find data. Where do I go to find this data? Who do I talk to? How do I talk to them? Do I trust them or not? It's, it's all about that experience. Think about the experience of uh, Amazon.com. You go to Amazon, you want to buy something, you can find the product, you can understand who's using the product, you understand the quality of the product, you can start thinking how to, how to use it. And the next one around, uh, in, in the journey is, I found the data, I know I want this data. Where do I go, what do I click to start getting access to this data? Right? And that's a pretty complex experience. Once I have access to this data, the next step is relatively straightforward. What technology do I have that can connect to this data so I can actually achieve what I want to achieve and deliver the, the, the value to organization, right? So regardless who you are, if you deal with data, especially in analytics, the journey always starts with the first three steps. I need to find it, I need to find how to access it, I need to find how to use it. So from that point, uh, let's talk about what does it mean to talk about access to data? I mean, really, we're here to talk about security and access. I think there, there was a slide which I really like because it kind of connects to this, around cross-section between authorization and authentication, right? For us, it definitely is converging, not converging, it, it converged already, right? Now we need to catch up. Um, authentication, we, we, we usually think about authentication on a level of organizational hierarchy. You have a role of an organization, you have a role of an HR, you have some sort of an active directory, you're part of you know, 200 different groups, but we know who you are, we know your intent on a broad scale. But uh, when we talk about authorization, authorization really works on a level of a, what I would call business hierarchy. What action you can take within the context of the business, within the context of your question. What uh, data you can access. So we think about it from, I can have access to a database, that's my authentication and it's known and I can use AD for that. But what exactly can I do with this database? What data can I see out of the database? Can I see this account? Can I see this account from this uh, jurisdiction, let's say from Germany or from France or Switzerland? That's really a question we need to answer. And for that we need to bring additional hierarchies, like a business hierarchy or financial hierarchies in the picture. So the problem statement for us is really this. How do we merge it together, you know, talk about the cross section, so we can achieve a concept of a dynamic policy that will give us a right visibility on data. So dynamic policy is really that. And another one that we really want to do is understand, do we all need to do the same thing? From a, a big organization, you always end up with some common rules, some common rules around data. So can we create global policies and basically inherit them across organizations so people do not need to waste time and they become compliant by default? Once uh, we start doing policies which are specific to the particular data, uh, data set, I, I like analogy to kind of a you know, old days Java, I guess. You write once and you run it everywhere. With Immuta, we have opportunity to write a policy once and enforce it everywhere. That's really what we're looking at right now. The next one is monitoring. Uh, for, from our point of view, it's really around ensuring the risk. Can we understand and assess the risk of an impact when we make, introduce a change to a policy or introduce a policy? And the last one is, how do we do it all at scale? The challenge we have, obviously, is uh, J.P. Morgan has multiple lines of businesses, multiple businesses within this. So we have many, many, many different hierarchies. Someone has a very wide, someone is very deep, and the scalability we require is you know, on, on, at that level. So um, how do we think about managing hierarchy and start building a policy? The very first thing, we want to create this intersection. Immuta does well, and we already know how to handle uh, authentication. You know, how to deal with groups, how to deal with users, all easy. How do we bring a business hierarchy in the, in, in the equation? Uh, when we talk about uh, data analytics, we, we always, so not always, but oftentimes, we think uh, about uh, data interface as SQL. So how do we bring a very hierarchical structures, tree structures, uh, relational graph structures into uh, that relational kind of a, a space? Usually do it by normalizing into either tables or set of attributes like uh, hierarchy of attributes. Right? So that's the first step we, we, we took as we start thinking about this. The next one, okay, what are the options? What can we do with this data now? How do we start controlling policies? How do we write the policies in Immuta? So examples here are actual policies from Immuta. I copy pasted, that's what we tested with. So a uh, very first option, very easy option. We can start looking at the Immuta and start using the Immuta concept of where clause. Fundamentally, I can write a policy 
and apply a policy almost on a join function like a select and bring the select statement into the policy. Now policy can be applied. Immuted does all kinds of magic translating this policy into a native format, let's say Snowflake or Databricks or Redshift. And I know within the, that space the policy will be executed. I don't need to worry about the scale because all these platforms are designed to scale for the type of hierarchy and capacity we have. Uh, the challenge we have though is it kind of, this approach kind of breaks encapsulation. What I mean by encapsulation, if you look at the policy, the policy actually knows about physical tables that contain the hierarchy and physical columns of this hierarchy. So when we, when we think about encapsulation and portability, this type of policy is not very portable, but they're very easy to write. They're very easy to test with. So that's one option. Another option, think about your you know, good old days of working with databases. What you would normally do is, if you, especially if you have a policy which requires very, some, something very high complexity, five inner joints, and I have my good partner here that actually showed me this type of <laughs> example, five inner joints to define what the policy can do. Really complex. You don't want to do it as a text within a policy editor. You typically go in and you create your SQL view. Right? Once you create the view, you have very predictable experience, very predictable performance around it, and you can write policy in a very, very, very simple way. Uh, and this policy becomes very, very portable. There's a challenge. The challenge as we talk about data products, you break uh, in another, uh, let's say, uh, concept, and that is separation of roles. You typically want to create a data product, and you want to have somebody else to start applying a visibility rules on top of this product. With a view approach, you basically create a product as a view. So every time I've created a product, let's say I have traits. I have a traits, that's my data product. Uh, somebody wants to use it, they have their own business hierarchy, I need to create a view so it works. Somebody else wants to use it, they have a different hierarchy, I need to create another view so it works. So operationally, it creates quite a lot of overhead and proliferation of products. We cannot treat data once, we need to create data as views and join it all the time. Yep. Now, uh, third approach, and uh, mind you, those approaches are not mutually exclusive. Any one of them works, and we apply them in different ways across the organization. But the third approach is start uh, looking more into what Immuta provides from um, attribute management. I mean, in the end, what we want to do is write policies as ABAC policies, right? Attributes based policies. So think about this. I take my hierarchy and I flatten it into a set of attributes associated with my groups. I can load it into Muta directly, Muta does, you know, does it well and can manage that. Now I can write a, pro a policy which is pure policy based on attributes, pure ABAC policy. The example is here. What do I gain? I really gain, uh, I, I do have separation of roles because my policy is independent of data. Uh, I do have portable policy. This policy will execute in any environment where Muta can operate. I do get support for the policy test. We're gonna talk about policy tests a bit later. What may not work, and this is where we really invest in our time right now, is scalability. Some of these hierarchies may end up to be 500,000 uh, in depth, very, very wide, and pure mutations you need to do to flatten can go into millions, millions of attributes per user. And that becomes a challenge, right? But yet again, all three options will work, and all three options are out, kind of out of the box with some work with, with a policy editor we're using. Now, uh, policy as code. One of the challenges, and I, and I know uh, we're going to have more debate with Muta folks tomorrow, but uh, in, in, in our space, uh, when we talk about the policy, we do need to separate con concepts of uh, authoring, where you write the policy, from publishing and where policy is executed. And there are many reasons for it, and some of the reasons are controls that we have to do within the organization. So if you think about policy as code, we did build an environment where you can separate authoring where you connect with your LDAPs and catalogs and hierarchies and audits and all kinds of stuff, where we can author the policy. In this place, we, we start look, looking more and more into kind of make it checker concept where you can write the policy, you can test the policy. Once policy is tested, we have a very controlled process of how do we promote the policy into production. Production environment is more of a read-only instance where we promote the policy and we publish it out. One of the reasons for that is we can actually intercept policy publishing and start applying additional uh, controls around unit testing. How do we unit test the policy? How do we unit test or predict the impact of a policy change to the rest of the organization? And this is where uh, it, it really becomes complicated for us. Um, edge conditions, think about, I introduced a change to the policy. Edge condition would be, did I make something completely closed? Or did I make something completely open? How, how, how do I know? How would I test that? Uh, when I think about impact, 
Um, the last thing I want to do, and I've been in, in this business for know, 24 years. I've been on these calls many, many times. I don't want to get a call at midnight saying, hey, we have a regulatory report. needs to go out by 2 a.m. We stuck. And the reason we stuck is somebody introduced a change to some attribute, published a policy, and I cannot use this data because I have no access anymore. You know, in, in reality, when you think about data access, data access is not your endpoint in Snowflake on Databricks. Data access is your policy that as we define it within Snowflake and Databricks. And you can potentially just close it. And the goal for us is to make sure we can proactively understand who is going to be impacted, how they're going to be impacted, and the risk. Risk in this case would be we may have a policy and you know, 100,000 different users associated with the policy, but there is not a single query that is associated with the policy. So policy is kind of an orphan. So introducing a change to the leading, not a big deal. Right? So we need to be able to make this assessment before things go to production. Another one is policy aggregation. And this really becomes also very interesting. Um, when you think about data sets, when you think about policy, what we can do with a muta and what we want to do is really a combination of a column level policy, role level policy, subscription policy. On the same data set, you may end up with 100 different policies. In the end, when I execute a query, all these policies will be aggregated as part of my execution plan. And I only see what, I can res uh, what, what the aggregated, aggregated plan or policy can return to me. OK, so if I start introducing a change to one policy, what else is affected? How, how is it affected? Can we predict the visibility or hierarchy in which it is going to execute? That, that, that's a challenge for us as well that we're working through. And the last one is observability. So you probably all know about observability, well-defined concept. We've been talking about, I don't know, for a decade now. Uh, and initially, we started with observability from a concept of we have observability from infrastructure and application point of view, so we can better support our, our, our business use cases. Then we start talking more about data observability. Data observability kind of adds another dimension, a couple of dimensions around data. And the concept here is my infrastructure is great, my systems is amazing, everything works well, but my data is late or it has a quality issue. In the end, my business cannot run. So data observability in this case really brings together all these concepts. Now, how do we think about it from a policy point of view? Because policy becomes the access point for my data. So how do we bring it together? Uh, a, a example here, um, policy is really kind of an intersection of your data source definition, your, let's say, uh, model that, uh, of your data, your tags and classification around your data, your groups, and your attributes. And a cross-section is your policy. So if somebody decides to make a change to a data model, how can we give them enough tools, enough knowledge, that that change going upstream through the policy will actually affect the policy and what policy will do for the data? Because again, policy is the access point to this data now. Not, 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 not a database, not, not Snowflake or Databricks. If somebody introduces a change to attribute, how will that propagate? So this is where we are right now. Now, to bring it uh, together, let's talk about the user experience for a moment time and, and, and the goals we have uh, that, that we want to do. The goals uh, that we have is not around just securing data or controlling the data or creating a governance that we need for organization. It's really about self-service, self-service for data analyst. So if I bring this together now, you have somebody who can go into data catalog, and we already have these tools, and find the data what they want, understand what they're looking at, understand the quality behind data, uh, what data is meant for, all, all the good stuff. We have this data uh, secured with policies, you know, all sorts of immunity. We allow a user now to say, I have intent, this is my intent, I want to use this data for training purposes of my model, right? Based on this intent, which is again an attribute, we can match it to the best policy that can give them access to this data. Once that happens, and they can uh, go through a control flow where you have certain approvals, you know, certain audit trails, everything needs to be done, but we look at automation here, so there's nobody in the middle you know, doing 10 different clicks on different, 10 different tickets with SLA or, uh, I don't know, one day per ticket. So data scientist waits you know, two to three weeks before data is accessible. We're looking to automate it by matching intent, policy, and the catalog together. And once that happens, a user has access to data. With access to data, they can actually start delivering the product they meant to deliver. Yeah. So that's my pitch. Open to questions, Vinny. Yeah. First of all, 